from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Coming up on Ag Day. An awful lot of my buddies didn't make it through. They couldn't, couldn't, couldn't fly good enough, you see. But uh, I managed to get through that. Their numbers dwindling, we honor the greatest generation this Memorial Day. And we explore uniquely American history from what moves us. We wouldn't have missed this for the world. To what is just below the surface. I love old stuff. It's in the ground and old, I want it. And what keeps us going. You know, I'm fortunate for even the tough parts because it made me the man I am today. Ag Day, presented by the all-new Chevy Silverado, the strongest, most advanced Silverado ever. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. On this Memorial Day, we set aside the cookouts and lake outings to remember those who fought and died so that we may live free. For one cattle producer near Kansas City, the memory of fellow soldiers influence his work every day as he pursues an unfamiliar path. Tyne Morgan reports. One or two orders rolling this morning, so we can get those packed this afternoon. At the KC Cattle Company, the roots are shallow. 2018 being our first year of sales, um, we, we saw substantial growth, and, and 2019 is carrying into that. From battling drought in 2018, I don't think we'll be able to touch that field till next week. To fighting off relentless rains this year, this three-year-old business is no stranger to challenges. Last year, kind of dealing with the drought, that that was painful. But for Patrick Montgomery, the challenges fuel his fire making every victory that much sweeter. There wasn't anybody doing this in Kansas City yet. Montgomery decided to dive into raising Wagyu beef in 2016, and he made his first sale two years later. About 95% of our revenue is done through our website. While sales are strong, his focus this year is production. 2019 is really kind of being defined for us as figuring out how do we scale and how do we do that responsibly. The idea of the KC Cattle Company grew from an untraditional seed. I grew up 30 minutes south of here. My, my family, you know, they, they weren't in the agriculture business and about the most exposure I had to it in uh, high school was, you know, getting paid eight bucks an hour to uh, buck hay on a trailer. After graduating high school, Montgomery got a taste of college and decided that wasn't the path for him. So he dropped out, opting to enlist in the military. I kind of decided that my true calling was uh, pursuing a path to become an Army Ranger and uh, I decided college could wait. The next four and a half years shaped his future while creating a past he'll never forget. On my first deployment uh, in Ranger Regiment, my, my brother-in-law was killed um, in action in Paktika province in Afghanistan. And so, you know, I was tasked with, with bringing him back to my sister, which is, you know, probably be the, the greatest honor I have until I die. That honor and that tragedy, he says, led him on a deep, dark path for about a year and a half. I'm fortunate for even the tough parts because it made me the man I am today. And, uh, you know, I think about the things, if they would have changed just a little bit, uh, I wouldn't be standing here. When it came time to re-enlist, Montgomery knew he needed to change focus, deciding to pursue a degree in animal science with hopes of one day becoming a veterinarian. I got into the animal science program at Mizzou, and, and uh, I really enjoyed that. But I did figure out that, that the me medicine wasn't something I wanted to pursue. That experience birthed another idea. I kind of fell in love with business while I was there, and, and Casey Cattle Company was kind of the brain baby of those two passions. And as his brain baby became a reality, he ventured down another path. It was kind of by accident. There was no part of my marketing plan or anything like that that included, you know, being a 100% veteran-owned and veteran-operated cattle ranch. It's pretty cool to see, um, you know, the, cha the change in, in some of the guys that come out here and are transitioning from that military lifestyle to civilian life. So Montgomery says a fresh start surrounded by peaceful settings while being around others who share a similar story is the perfect formula to help restore veterans mental state of mind. That comboed with a little hard, hard physical labor is kind of the, uh, the secret sauce. Something to which Zeph Martinez. Oh, I love it. I, I can't see myself doing anything else. Can attest. The camaraderie aspect is definitely um, a huge factor. Um, being able to work uh, around guys see. that have had some of the same experiences as you, you've had. Martinez has been working here since August of 2018 and met Montgomery through War Horses for Veterans. And I've tried a couple of other jobs since being out and uh, a lot of them weren't hitting the mark. You know, money wise, yeah, they were all right, but 
I was definitely uh, not happy. While Martinez is employed here full time, others volunteer to do something they love while turning this passion. So I'm writing a note to this customer. Her first name's Tiffany. Into gratitude. Every order usually will get a personal note. For customers continued support. What, what I'm doing now doesn't look anything like what I wrote down on paper a couple years ago. So it was kind of cool to see um, you know, the interactions that, that God's had in my own life to kind of turn Casey Cattle Company into what it is now. Today, Montgomery says Casey Cattle Company strives to do well by doing good for others. A Memorial Day message he wants other veterans to hear. Especially Memorial Day, I think uh, something a lot of us struggle with is, is the buddies we no longer have here. And I think it's just really important to remember that if those guys were here, they'd tell you to that they don't want you to be self-destructive. They want you to go find that next path in life that's gonna make you feel fulfilled. Still ahead on this special edition of Ag Day, we celebrate our history by hitting the rails to see what connected America's coast and helped get American product moving. And celebrate those who were there when history happened as we spend some time with a member of the greatest generation. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. Trains, they change so much in our country, the way we travel, the way we move things, and now part of that history is being celebrated. Several thousand train lovers gathering this month in Utah to catch a glimpse of a pair of restored 1940s era steam engine and celebrate the 150th anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. After the two historic trains met, there was a ceremonial tapping of a spike. There was also a celebration where the final golden spike was hammered in back in May of 1869. When, when the United States connected East and West through a tra transcontinental railroad, it changed America forever. You know, before the railroad, it took six months to go from New York to San Francisco, and you risked your life. Afterwards, it took about 10 days, and it was relative comfort. Descendants of Chinese laborers who worked on the railroad also part of the celebration. Workers putting in 12-hour days and brutal conditions to build the railroad by hand. Now this month began a year-long celebration of that transcontinental railroad and it's a party rolling along with help from, as I mentioned, a nearly 80-year-old steam locomotive. 150 years in the making. We wouldn't have missed this for the world. The big boy, number 4014, rolling across the Wyoming plains near Cheyenne. Well, it's, uh, it's going to be the largest operational steam engine in the world. You know, I mean, how can you not oh, wow. get excited about that? Longer than two city buses, weighing more than a fully loaded Boeing 747 and able to pull the equivalent of 16 Statues of Liberty over a mountain. The big boy making a reappearance after some 70 years of retirement. Back in the 1940s when freight railroads were moving a lot of things, you know, with steam power, you needed a big locomotive to get over that hill. Big boy engines hauled freight between Wyoming and Utah in the 1940s and 50s. Of the 25 built by the American Locomotive Company in Schenectady, New York from 1941 to 1944, eight remain. When you rebuilt the Transcontinental Railroad uh, back in the 1800s, I mean, how are you going to get over the Rocky Mountains was very key. Today, thanks to five years of restoration, only number 4014 is operational. You look inside the cab, you see all the knobs, you better know what you're turning. That's our water level right here. Ed Dickens headed up the restoration. It looks really complex and complicated, somewhat intimidating. When you learn about steam locomotives, all of those valves have a specific purpose. Operating the big boy requires a two-person crew to monitor the 1.2 million pound machine. Because we rebuilt this, we designed everything to customize what I want as an engineer and what the fireman wants as a fireman. So as I'm sitting right here positioned looking out as I need to, the speedometer is right in line with me, everything's within easy reach, the whistle is just a little right here. Engineered for those steep mountain grades, each big boy was built with two huge engines beneath a 250 ton boiler, a feat still drawing crowds 150 years past the first golden spike. 
So to come, while some are rebuilding history, others are looking for it underground. One man's unique hobby that has led to several amazing discoveries, next. Join Andrew McRae for Farming the Countryside, a farmer-focused podcast that is all about production agriculture. Farming the Countryside is available wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and is brought to you by Nutrien Ag Solutions, the world's largest provider of crop inputs and services. No doubt each acre of farmland is covered in history. Ag Day videographer Russ Natusco introduces us to a man who loves to go searching for clues to the past below ground in upstate Indiana. I'm Gary Cornwell. I'm a treasure hunter. I love old stuff. It's in the ground and old, I want it. This hasn't been lived on for a hundred years. There's no aluminum out here. There's no you know, recent trash, and since what we're looking for is old stuff, you can kind of be guaranteed that you're gonna find nothing but. If we're looking for anything that shows, that can tell us anything about the people that lived here, whether they had kids, whether they were wealthy, whether they weren't. There's a lot of things that we find interesting that you can find in the ground that show us these things. Anything metallic is gonna tell us a story. Along the way, I've dug just about everything out of the ground you can imagine. It looks like possibly a base to some kind of a hand tool that maybe a wood shaft went up into. And seriously old. You know, that's got to be 1890s or so, probably. I'll throw it in there. There's just about everything under the sun in there. There's a cowbell. You can never have too much cowbell. <laughs> oh, all kinds of good stuff ends up in a purview. How? So that was their trash dump. That, that was their garbage can back in the day, you know. In 1870, there was no dump. They say dig it all and you'll make sure you get it all. This is a Winchester, probably from the teens or 20s maybe. I've always been uh, a kind of a treasure hunter, even since I was a little kid. And so it just one thing led to another and it progressed to where I'm at now. You know, how far can you cover in 15 minutes if you're in somebody's yard or something like that? You could cover a lot of ground, especially with a great big coil. It is the great possibility that exists like a scratch off ticket. When you look at a piece of ground, you don't know what's there until you go over it and it could be anything. All right, thanks Russ. When we come back, digging up some great deals on livestock equipment with Machinery Pete. And later, a heartfelt moment between a granddaughter and her grandfather as he remembers his days in battle. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. Memorial Day is typically celebrated around a grill at some point during the weekend. Well, in honor of that, Machinery Pete has a look at equipment prices our livestock producers may be interested in. Manure spreaders? Heck yeah, I've been covering auction prices on them almost 30 years now. Now, I'd have to say the last uh, year or two, values on good used manure spreaders have been holding very steady. In fact, pretty much all good used livestock equipment have been holding steady. Now, if we took a very common spreader example, let's take the New Holland 195 and use this as an illustration. Now, New Holland obviously has made this model a lot of years, but it's very interesting if we look at the last 23 195s that have sold at auction, average sale price $8,494. Now, that's actually 12.3% higher than the average auction price on a New Holland 195 spreader six years ago back in the year 2013. Now the last year or so, I've actually seen a number of 195 sold at auction for almost retail price. Now here's a picture of a 2016 model 195 spreader. This is for sale today in machinerypeat.com in Fort Atkinson, Iowa, Franz and Sales and Service. And on the lot, they're asking $15,900. Okay, so just under 16K. Well, here's a picture of a New Holland 195 that sold Last March, March of 18, on a farm auction in Woodlake, Minnesota, sale price, $16,000. Now, more recently, here's a picture that shows a pair of New Holland 195 sold on recent auctions. 
both for $11,000. On the left, this one sold, this 195 sold in North Central Ohio on March 2nd, again, 11,000 bucks. And on the right, that New Holland 195 spreader sold April 27th, farm auction, Southeast Minnesota, again, $11,000, quite a bit above that average sale price. Still ahead, what this Memorial Day is really all about as we honor the legacy of one serviceman, a man who had a strong connection to our own Betsy Gibbon. Betsy shares his story of sacrifice and survival next. Your next piece of equipment is on machinerypeat.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on machinerypeat.com. Introducing Farm Journal TV, on demand 24-7. Ag Day, Machinery Pete TV. U.S. Farm Report on your phone and tablet. Download the Farm Journal TV mobile app today. This Memorial Day, we pause to remember those who died in service to our country. The U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs says there are less than a half a million out of 16 million World War II veterans still alive. One of the so-called greatest generation was Lieutenant Howard Douglas Oppheim, the grandfather of Ag Day's own Betsy Gibbon. Now, Betsy interviewed her grandfather just a few months before he passed away. Kneeling next to my grandfather in his home, I catch him reading as he often does. This time, the 96-year-old is entrenched in memories of Operation Varsity. I was always very thankful that I made it. Dawn, 24th March, south of Paris. Paratroopers begin to assemble for the greatest single airborne operation in all history. From nearby French airfields, the paratroopers take off. The assault took place east of the Rhine River. Lieutenant Howard Douglas Opheim flew one of the 1,600 transport aircraft carrying paratroopers and supplies. I looked up in the sky, and there was just planes and just glider pilots and so forth, as far as you could see. Lieutenant Opheim's C-47 plane full of 20-plus paratroopers soared at 1,500 feet. Anything below or above was too dangerous, knowing he'd likely never see any of them again. There weren't very many of those uh, boys that we dropped paratroopers that ever survived. That mission wasn't exactly what my grandfather had in mind when he dreamed of becoming a pilot. Born November 1921, the Fairbault, Minnesota native grew up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It was there he watched and admired Charles Lindbergh as he glided above him in flight during the 1920s. I thought, boy, that'd be a good thing to get into the flying business. <laughs> He enrolled at South Dakota State University before enlisting in the Army Air Corps in 1942, earning his wings in 1944. An awful lot of my buddies didn't make it through. They couldn't, couldn't, couldn't fly good enough, you see. But uh, I managed to get through that. He flew C-47s after aspirations of becoming a fighter pilot dimmed when training flights made him sick. I couldn't take that real tight turns, so I, I get to be a fighter pilot. What are your memories of flying a C-47? Well, it was a real good airplane, but you know, it was slow. And uh, we trained for, it seemed like forever in England before we really got into combat. Pretty routine except for one unusual day. Here this fighter pilot, a German fighter pilot came and flew right alongside of us. He was either out of, out of ammunition or I don't know what why, but he gave us a whirl. And then he turned it off and, and uh, flew away. Until finally, welcoming news scratched across the radio during one of his flights. And that particular day, Japan capitulated. It was a bit that made us very happy. Could you point out your route? As I continue to kneel, I grab for more stories and hang on to his every word. As these heroes pass, I speak for my family and so many others. 
We wish we had another day with you. We are thankful for the time we had, the lives lived, and we'll hold these memories tight. As Americans, your service will not be forgotten. Thank you, Bessie, for sharing that story. That's all the time we have. We're sure glad you tuned in. It's been part of your Memorial Day with us from all of us here at Ag Day. I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.